Every time you sing a hymn of consecration, remember God's listening to what you sing. Living for Jesus. O oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee, for thou and thine atonement didst give thyself for me. I own no other master, <laughs> although sometimes some, we, times some of us uh, act like we had a different master. My heart shall be thy throne, Jesus, on the throne of your life. My life I give henceforth, that is from this minute onward, my life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. You sang that four times. Did you mean it? My life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. Serious words, especially when you're singing them as an act of worship, which this is. It's a time of worship. It's an act of worship. It's not merely the introductory part of a service. And you're promising Jesus that for the rest of your life, you will live for him and for him alone. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 21. And you may wonder at first why we have this title on the sermon, The Gospel at Satan's Throne. The Gospel at Satan's Throne, Acts chapter 21. Tonight we're looking at verses 1 through 6. We finished last week our farewell to Ephesus, where they go down to the seashore. Paul gets on board the ship. They all cry and pray and give him a hug and kiss goodbye because they know that they'll never see him again. And now he's going to go somewhere else. And it came to pass that after we were gotten from them and had launched, we came with straight course unto Kuos, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence to Patara. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set forth. Now when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unlaid her burden. <clears throat> and finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And when we had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way. And they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave of one another, we took ship and they returned home again. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you again for your wonderful word, its power. We thank you, Father, that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We pray, Father, that you will use your word that way tonight, that you will help us to understand the kind of spiritual warfare that we're involved in and how you place beachheads in places where Satan is resident. And you use your people in powerful ways in those places. How we thank you, Father, that you've placed us here as a beachhead in a very wicked community, in a wicked state, in a wicked country, and yet, the gospel of Christ is here. And you have other little outposts scattered around all over the world, holding forth the truth of the gospel of Christ. So, Father, we pray for your blessings upon our time tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, farewell to Ephesus, part number five, was what we had looked at last week, the, the last of a series dealing with this incredible message that the Apostle Paul gives where we have all kinds of very important doctrinal truths where we see things in a historical light, where we understand the way in which Paul's missionary journeys functioned, where we can see the practical application of the scriptures and which doctrines Paul preached so that there would be practical application and the changing of lives. We saw a number of lessons. Lesson one was for church leaders. Teach everything that's profitable but major on the majors, and he listed five majors, repentance, faith, the gospel, grace, and the kingdom of God, which is the millennial kingdom of Christ. In other words, how to live the Christian life in light of the imminent return of Christ. We don't omit other things, but we major on the majors. Lesson two was be consistent and transparent. If you're doing it right, you don't have to change your lifestyle or your doctrine. Lesson three was preach content, preach the word realizing that sometimes you receive specific directions where to preach and where not to preach, but always it's content. 
There are a lot of churches today, or so-called churches, which pre preach fluff and cotton candy. Uh, they never preach content. They tell lots and lots of stories. Nothing wrong with telling a story every now and then to emphasize a point, but it's got to be content, content, content from the Word of God. The lesson number four we learned was preach the light, preach in light of the imminent return of Christ. We need to preach fervently as dying men to dying men. We need to understand that Christ is coming back very soon. We need to understand that the world around us is passing away and the lusts thereof. Lesson number five, we will be held accountable for not preaching all the counsel of God. Remember, he's talking to the Ephesian elders here. But it applies not merely to the elders or the pastor, it applies to all of us. So don't be afraid of offending people. We will be held accountable for the opportunities that we passed by and did not take advantage of. Lesson six we learned was the temptation to compromise is great, but don't do it. God promises that he will make it possible for you to resist those temptations. And we looked at the 12 different temptations that every Christian faces from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We learned that almost all temptations fall into one of 12 categories. The first test, the first temptation is failure to know Bible history and the heroes of the faith. It's a matter of sloth. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. Lesson number two, or the test number two, is faith in fearful times. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, that takes us back to the Exodus. We're constantly being reminded, both in Old Testament and New Testament, of the Exodus and of how God delivers miraculously. Faith in fearful times. Test number three was open identification with Christ. And we talked about the meaning of baptism and it not being either salvation or sanctification, but identification. All well, were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Test number four, spiritual growth. The verse three said, we did all eat the same spiritual meat. Test five was spiritual fellowship and all did drink of the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. And you've heard me preach a number of sermons in the past about that. That the water, rock in the wilderness was not some kind of a natural formation which had a lot of water stored up inside it. And Moses just happened to be there at that particular rock at that time when he struck the rock and gave enough water for more than two million people to drink. If it was just a big rock with a little bit of water inside it, not all two million would have gotten a drink. Paul tells us that spiritual rock was Christ. Test number six, responding to spiritual discipline for disobedience, anger, gluttony, sloth, pride, lust, envy, and greed. Verse 5 tells us, but with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Test number 7 is the lusts of the flesh. Now these were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, which of course included the gluttony above. Test number 8 was idolatry, which we've seen as we mentioned also this morning. Covetousness is idolatry, and so you find idolatry at the beginning of the Ten Commandments, and you find it as covetousness at the last of the Ten Commandments. God ties it together on both ends, because we live in a material world, and we tend to be greedy and grab for the things of this world. Covetousness is idolatry. Number nine was entertainment. Things like sports and hobbies can become idolatry, and that's a, a test that we all face. It's written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Test number 10 is sex. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. 23,000 people got killed in one day. Folks, that's a lot of people. There's a lot more people than we have here in church. <laughs> 23,000 people. God's serious about it. Test number 11 was rebellion. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Test number 10 was complaining. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. <clears throat> First Corinthians 10 is a good passage to study. It gives you the 12 different major tests that every believer faces and that every believer has the power to overcome. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. That's down three verses later in verse 13. We saw the three applications of those tests down in verses 11 and 12. Example, warning, and a fivefold guarantee. The example was, these things happened unto them for examples, and they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So we know that this is not an inappropriate application of what I've just told you of these 12 different tests. Number two is a warning. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. 
And then the guarantee, which I've just given to you, it's a guarantee of commonality, a guarantee of divine faithfulness, a guarantee of strategic placement in the battle. God puts you where he wants you in the battle. You and I are about foot soldiers. We're not generals. We're not colonels. We're not captains. We're not lieutenants. We're not even sergeants. We're most of us private first class. And the general commanding the army is the one who guarantees that he's going to have soldiers at the key locations in the battle all the way through the war. Have you ever wondered why God put you here? It's because we have a commander in chief who has an assignment to do. We look around at the ragtag little group that we've got, the platoon of soldiers who are wounded and getting a little older and uh, not always organized and sort of scrambled in the way that we go about things. And God says, you're the platoon that I'm leading forward in Collingswood. Go into the battle. We're going to talk more about the battle tonight because we're in a battle with Satan. Remember the message, the gospel at Satan's throne? The gospel at Satan's throne. We're in a battle, folks. And we have not merely strategic placement in the battle, but we have power and we have victory. Those are the five promises that are given in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which I just quoted for you. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. That's commonality. But God is faithful. That's the divine faithfulness. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. That's the strategic placement in the battle. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape. That's the power that you may be able to bear it. That's the victory. We noted that even the great prophets faced temptation to compromise and they overcame it. For example, Jeremiah, and we gave you the whole passage out of Jeremiah, where Jeremiah tries to make excuses just like Moses made excuses. And God says, look, Jeremiah, you know, get on the stick, get out there and do what I told you to do. That's what God says to us, too. Quit making complaints. Quit making excuses. Just do what I told you to do and you'll see that I win the victory. God can do that. He can do that as we go out into battle with the priests leading in the front, blowing the trumpets, and God himself slays the enemy. Lesson seven was we must warn the wicked that judgment is coming. That's why I've been preaching on hell for the last three weeks in the morning worship services. We saw the application of transdispensational principles that Paul gives in Acts 20. And we saw that in Ezekiel chapter 3 and Ezekiel chapter 33, which Paul is quoting here in this passage, that we will be held accountable for the blood of those who die in their sins if we don't warn them. It's a principle that is a transdispensational principle. It applies across the lines from the Old Testament law into the age of grace in which we are living. That's the way Paul quotes it there. And then we're going to have to someday give an account to Christ for why we did not warn the people with whom we had contact when we had the opportunity to share with them the gospel of Christ, to warn them that judgment is coming, to tell them there's a way of escape by trusting in Jesus. We will have to give an account for that someday. We saw that Paul was speaking to the Ephesian elders. It was designed to bring elders up to speed here. We looked at the 23 biblical qualifications for elders in the scripture and the 17 biblical qualifications for deacons that are listed in the scripture, both in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus chapter 1. And none of those qualifications are optional. They're all mandatory for church leadership because Satan will attack the church. And when the leaders are not prepared, they will fall. Very important lessons, and we will not go back over those again. So tonight, that brings us to Acts chapter 21, verses 1 through 6, which we've just read tonight. Acts chapter 21. When Paul arrived at Tyre, did you notice something? It says he found disciples who were all ready there. He tells you all the different places he stopped, and Luke, who's writing the book of Acts and his traveling companion with the Apostle Paul, apparently really enjoyed writing about their voyages. He tells you every place they went. That's why we're able to track where Paul went on his three missionary journeys. But they got to Tyre, and they stayed there for seven days in Tyre. But when they got there, there were already disciples there. Now, Paul has not been to Tyre on one of his previous missionary journeys. His first time stopping off at Tyre. And yet there are already disciples. Now, we don't know how those disciples got there. We don't know 
how those people came to Christ. Perhaps it was Barnabas and Mark, but we're not told. You remember, Paul and Silas uh, went one direction, and Barnabas and Mark went the other direction because Paul got into a fight with Barnabas over whether or not they should take Mark with them on that second journey who had departed from them on the first journey. And he went with not, not with them to the work, it says. And so Paul said, look, he's a flake. We don't need him. You know, he, he let us down the last time. He's got to grow up some. He's still a kid. We need some seasoned warriors to go into this fight. And Barnabas said, no. After all, that was his nephew. Barnabas said, no, I'm going to take him. Paul said, no, we're not going to take him. Barnabas said, yes, I will. Paul said, no. And the contention was so sharp that they split up. And God formed two missionary teams out of that fight. Now, we don't have all of the record about Barnabas' travels. God chose not to give that to us. You know, but it'll be exciting someday in heaven. I think we're going to get a chance to look back and see how God used individuals in different areas and in different locations to spread the gospel of Christ. And you know, someday as we study church history at the feet of Jesus, where he shows us what he did through us, do you know who some of the heroes of faith are going to be? They're sitting here tonight in this auditorium. If you read Hebrews chapter 11, you read about all those famous heroes of faith that we all know about. And then it says, and others, and it tells you about those who were martyred. And then it closes with, that they without us should not be made perfect, not be complete. That list doesn't stop with Hebrews 11. That list has been going on since the book of Hebrews was finished, generation after generation, century after century, for the past 2,000 years, as names are added to the roster. And I want to be on that list. I hope you do too. And all the world doesn't know right now about those faithful men and women of God who have carried the gospel of Jesus Christ, who have been unashamed of the testimony, who may not have gone to what we call the mission field, but they had a mission field at home. They had neighbors, they had friends, they had associates at work, they had contacts as they traveled on the bus, on the train, on the plane, as they were standing in line at the grocery stores, as they were doing their shopping, as they were talking to clerks, as they ran into people, as they were standing and waiting for things maybe standing in line at the post office. I've had opportunities even at the post office standing in line to share Christ with people. You're in that list. We don't know who led those people to Christ at Tyre. But somebody led them to Christ. It might have been Barnabas. It might have been Mark. It might have been somebody else that led them to Christ because there were many others besides Paul spreading the word. We tend to forget this. Chapter 8 of Acts, it told us, you remember, and Saul consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution of the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc to the church, of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Now look at verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. <laughs> Do you know why persecution arose in chapter 7 and chapter 8? Chapter 7, Stephen's sermon at his death. Chapter 8, the persecution that scatters the believers is because the believers refused to obey the last command Jesus gave before he ascended into heaven. You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And so they sat at Jerusalem and the church grew. And man, that was an exciting church. They got 3,000 people saved on the, uh, on the day of Pentecost, and then 
We find another 5,000 are added to it a couple of chapters later, so they got 8,000 people, and pretty soon the church is growing so much that they have to, in chapter 6, appoint deacons because the apostles, even though there are 12 of them, they don't have time just to take care of the widows. There were so many widows in the church. And so they appointed the deacons that we find in Acts chapter 6. They were having a great time at Jerusalem. Everything was organized. They had leadership that they could count on. They were meeting the needs of the believers. But it wasn't what God told them to do. He had told them Jerusalem, and that's where they were. And they hadn't gone any farther. And Judea, and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And so God raised persecution. Do you think that it's possible that some of the things that we see today might be along the same lines because we have failed to do what Jesus told us to do in reaching the world for Christ? Tyre. Here we are. We're at Tyre. Somewhere along the line, some faithful believer had gone to Tyre, a Phoenician city, a city covered with idolatry and paganism and wickedness and that had a horrible history going back to the days of Tyre and Sidon and Ethbaal and Jezebel, the daughter of the king of Sidon, which was under the rule of Tyre. That was a pretty nasty place. But there were disciples there. Somebody went where you might think the gospel would never reach. Did you know that in Ezekiel chapters 26, 27, and 28, there are three full chapters given to curses against the city of Tyre? Did you know that in Ezekiel 28, Tyre had historically been the seat or the throne of Satan. And here is the gospel in Tyre. And it wasn't just Paul, the mighty one, who had brought it there. It was some unknown believer who had penetrated the kingdom of Satan. He may have you as an unknown believer do the same thing. As we read Ezekiel chapter 28, there are two personages mentioned. There's one called the Prince of Tyre. There's one called the King of Tyre. And we're going to, to look at that in just a moment. But we need to remember, when we read this passage out of Ezekiel 28 in a moment, we need to remember that God invades Satan's territory. We tend to think of ourselves as the embattled church, and so we wrap ourselves in our armor, and we sit there back to back, sort of like the Spartans did at Thermopylae, and wait for the enemy to come. That's not the picture that is given of the church in the New Testament. The picture of the church that is given in the New Testament is invading Satan's territory. That's what the book of Acts is about. Believers invading Satan's territory. Jesus said so. Do you remember Matthew chapter 16, verse 18? Peter has just made his great confession of faith. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, faith in Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto thee, Peter. But he says something else. Upon this rock I'll build my church, and it's not upon Peter, it's upon the confession of faith. He says, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now listen to the last phrase of that verse. We tend to forget it. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Do you understand? Gates are stationary. Gates don't move around. Gates are not on the offensive. Gates are on the defensive. The gates of hell 
are defending Satan's territory and it is the army of Christ that is attacking the gates and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We need to remember that. Now hear what Ezekiel 28 says about Tyre. And the two personages I mentioned just a moment ago, the prince of Tyre and the king of Tyre. And this is where we find Paul for seven days with believers who are already there. And believers who within seven days bond with him. So much so that they all, with their families, their wives and children. We saw just the elders before, but now we've got the wives and the children coming down to the seashore and, and weeping goodbye as the apostle Paul leaves as they're down there on the beach. They've bonded with him. They're true believers. They're people who are standing firm in the midst of a culture that was totally opposed to the gospel of Christ. They had families with them. Wives and children. It wasn't just a group of tough men missionaries. Ezekiel 28. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not a God. Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches, and hast gotten gold and silver and unto treasure. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. He's described a lot of that back in chapters 26 and 27. Tyre was a very powerful Phoenician city. Tyre was an incredibly wealthy city. Tyre controlled the sea trade. Tyre made sure that the pirates didn't attack the ships of Tyre. They would track them down and kill them. It was the powerhouse of the ancient naval world. They had brilliant leaders. Ezekiel's writing about that. That's the prince of Tyre. Verse 6, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore I'll bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations. They shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom. They shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit. Thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? Thou shalt be a man and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. The prince of Tyre was going to die. And God prophesied he'd die in battle and he'd die by the hand of some guy that he didn't know and that wasn't anybody in particular. And he wasn't going to be able to claim I'm a God, just like Pharaoh claimed he was a God. The prince of Tyre, the one who would be considered by us the human king of Tyre, Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Now we get to the one who's behind the prince of Tyre, the ruler of Tyre. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You say, well, maybe the prince was just a human prince. He was the young guy and the, the king of Tyre was the old guy. No, we discover something about the king of Tyre in the very next verse that could never be said of a human king at 570 B.C. when Ezekiel writes this book. Say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in all thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. The king of Tyre is described as someone who has been in the garden of God 
someone who is a direct creation from the hand of God, someone who has musical instruments built into his body, one who was an anointed cherub. You remember in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of that was a hilasterion, the Greek word for the mercy seat. And over the mercy seat hovered two cherubs. But there had been a third cherub, a cherub who fell. Lucifer, son of the morning. There are three members of the Godhead. And this is speculation, but I suspect that the anointed cherub that fell may have been the cherub that primarily served the Son. And so the Son came to redeem men from the work that Satan had done. We're talking about the king of Tyre here. This was where Satan's throne had been located. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee out as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, thou covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes on the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and shalt never be any more. There's coming a day when Satan will finally be cast into the lake of fire. Now originally Tyre had two parts to the city. It had a fortified city on the mainland. It was almost an impregnable fortified city. Nebuchadnezzar had besieged it, was not able to destroy it. Because it also had a, an impregnable fortress on an island one half mile offshore. So Nebuchadnezzar took the mainland, but he was never able to conquer the fortified city of Tyre on the island. That had to wait until 332 B.C. In 332 B.C., Alexander the Great besieged the city of Tyre. He also conquered the city on the mainland. And then, of course, once again, the residents fled to the island. And so Alexander said, you know, Nebuchadnezzar couldn't solve the problem, but I can solve the problem. What he had his entire army do, they had just destroyed the city of Tyre again, they picked up all the rocks, all the rubble, all the timber, all the little stones, the sand, and even the dust, and they threw it into the sea, and they built a causeway a half mile long by throwing it by hand. They didn't have big earth-moving machines like we have today. They took it by hand, maybe using their helmets and digging up the dirt and throwing it into the sea and going back and getting another helmet full of dirt and throw it into the sea until they built a causeway all the way out to the island and he marched his army across the causeway to the island and defeated the city of Tyre and destroyed it. Did you know that that was prophesied by Ezekiel in chapter 26? Verse 12 through 14. They shall make a spoil of thy riches that, and make a prey of thy merchandise, and they shall break down thy walls and destroy thy pleasant houses, and they shall lay thy stones and thy timber and thy dust in the midst of the water. And I will cause the noise of thy songs to cease, and the sound of thy harp shall be no, heard no more. And I will make thee like a top of a rock. Thou shalt be a place to spread nets upon. Thou shalt be built no more, for I, the Lord, hath spoken it, saith the Lord God. They took everything off 
and made it a place to spread nets, which they do there today. Dear people, the Word of God is accurate, it's precise. The ancient mainland city of Tyre is no more. Oh, there's that little village out there on the island, and that's no longer an island, it's now at the end of a peninsula. And that's where we find the Apostle Paul going. But that had at one time been the seat of Satan. Something else we discover as we study scripture is that the seat of Satan rotates between locations depending on his current plans and his attempts at world governance. He always moves to where the action is. He's always moving toward the central seats of power in human government. I'm going to show you that in just a second. He's always moving to where the movers and shakers are located who are interested in accomplishing what the scripture has prophesied as his plans, as Satan's plans, for a one world government. Sometimes he has Jewish headquarters. Sometimes he has Gentile headquarters, as we see here in Ezekiel. But as we get to the book of Revelation, we discover his seat moving around to at least four different places. To Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, and to Philadelphia. In Smyrna, we find a warning about the synagogue of Satan. In Pergamos, we find a statement that that is where Satan's seat is and where Satan dwelleth. In Thyatira, we have a warning about the depths of Satan. In Philadelphia, we have again, as rotating back to Smyrna, the synagogue of Satan. Let me read you those four passages. These are from four of the seven letters to the churches that the Lord Jesus Christ sent by the hand of his amanuensis, John, to the seven churches, to the, it says the angels of the seven churches, that's the angeloi. They weren't being written to angelic beings. They were being written to those who were the messengers. The word angelos means a messenger of the seven churches. The one who would be proclaiming the message of God to the churches. We would call them the pastors today. Revelation 2, verse 8. Unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. And you recall already in the... Uh, the first vision that he gets in chapter 1, the Son of Man vision, where the Lord Jesus Christ is portrayed, each one of these churches is referenced back to that revelation to some aspect of the person of Christ in chapter 1. These things that the first and the last, which was dead and is alive, that's Christ. So Jesus is speaking to the church at Smyrna. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. This is a church that was under persecution. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. Ah, the devil. He's not talking about all the demons. They were faced with the devil himself. The synagogue of Satan was located there. Satan had headquarters at a local synagogue. He will cast some of you into prison that you may be tried. You shall have tribulation ten days, but be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. It was the martyr church. Folks, we may be soon facing the same things that the church at Smyrna faced. Where Satan is, he seeks the death of Christians. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. That was written not merely to Smyrna, that was written to us. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. Then he gets to Pergamos. We jump down a verse. And he says, to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, these things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thou works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. 
Satan had moved his headquarters around. Thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But Satan had done an even dirtier work at Pergamos. At Smyrna, all he'd been able to do was to kill the believers there. But at Pergamos, he had infiltrated the church. Verse 14, I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. You remember Balaam and Balak? Remember the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 23? We find Balak had hired Balaam to place a curse on Israel. And Balaam tried three different times. And you know all the warnings that God gave to Balaam and finally where the, the donkey fell down under him and he beat the donkey and the donkey talked to him and then he saw the angel that was standing in the way with the sword to kill him? Oh, the prophet who woke up. And yet he still wanted the money. He still wanted the money. So he went and he said, you know, I can't curse Israel. And he blessed Israel. But it tells us later what he did to get his money. He told Balak, look, I can't curse him. But I can tell you what to do so that God will judge Israel himself. You go out and get a bunch of your pretty Moabitess girls. <laughs> you realize Ruth was a Moabitess? It's interesting how God redeems even from those who are wicked. He said, you send those girls down into the camp of the Israelites. They got a, a bunch of nice young men down there. Your girls can go down and sweet talk them. And your girls don't mind committing fornication. You tell them to go down there and seduce, seduce some Jewish boys. And God judged Israel. Balaam got paid. But three months later, Israel invaded the land and it says, Balaam the son of Basor, they slew with the sword. He was covetous. He got his money. He enjoyed it for a very, very short time. And they killed him. But Satan hasn't changed his tactics. I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. God had judged Israel in the Old Testament. He gives that as an illustration here of what he was going to do at Pergamos. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written. You know the song, I have a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, yes, it's mine. It comes from this verse, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. It was a place where Satan's seed is and where Satan dwelleth. And he had infiltrated the church, not merely killed believers. If he can't manage to kill you, he will try to compromise you. Thyatira. Satan had been there too. The depths of Satan. Revelation 2.18. Unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. Now I mentioned this morning about fire and brass. Brass, when it's seen in Scripture, is always a picture of judgment. And here is Christ standing as a judge at the church at Thyatira. And notice something else. It's a church that likewise had been infiltrated, even though it was an active church, it was a church that had been infiltrated by the same kind of things that we saw going on at Pergamos. 
I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. It was a good church in terms of its activity. It was a diligent church. It was a church busy serving Jesus. It was an evangelistic church. It was an outreach church. It was a church that worked and worked and worked and worked for Jesus. Verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. It was a charismatic church. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. Now, just a minute. We mentioned Jezebel a few minutes ago, didn't we? Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of Sidon, which was under the rule of Tyre, wife of Ahab, who tried to kill the prophet Elijah, whose name is associated with wickedness all over the Bible. And they have a female leader in the church at Thyatira. Lydia was from Thyatira. I doubt seriously that she's the Jezebel here. But it was a women's group that first got saved. And apparently some had taken leadership. Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Ah, same two crimes that we saw for the church at Pergamos. Preaching that grace means that you can do anything that you want. Teaching that grace means lasciviousness. I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. She herself was involved in it. She was setting an example of it. So Jesus says, You like the bed? Behold, I will cast her into a bed. And them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and the hearts. Ah, remember we talked about that this morning, that... Thou shalt not commit adultery has been broadened by Jesus in Matthew chapter 5. Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And so God searches the reins, the hearts, the emotions, the seed of desires, and I will give to every one of you according to your works. But I say unto you and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, there was a remnant in Thyatira that had not known the depths of Satan as they speak. I will put upon you none other burden, but that which you have already hold fast till I come. Keep hanging on, I'm coming. Keep hanging on, I'm coming. Keep hanging on, I'm coming. Even when the church is infiltrated and the church in the United States has been infiltrated and the church in the United States is involved in all kinds of wickedness and immorality, and new evangelicalism says it's okay. And now there are many, many evangelical, quote unquote, leaders who are saying that gay marriages are okay and why in the world are we standing against it? Dear people, that's the church of Thyatira. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. That is, you're coming back with Jesus to rule with a rod of iron. That's a quotation out of Psalm 2, which is a prophecy that Jesus Christ will come back and smite the nations of the earth at the end of the tribulation. As vessels of a potter shall they be broken in shivers, even as I received my father's, and I will, the Father, and I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That is, keep hanging on. Keep hanging on, even when you see... Not merely persecution and death of believers, but when you see the church infiltrated and you see the filthiness of the church being infiltrated and you see leadership in the church saying it's okay to do these things and you see the, the prophetic leaderesses out there doing it and setting example for it, hang on. You've not known the depths of Satan. 
You've rejected the depths of Satan. You've held to the truth. Hold fast. Keep hanging on because I'm coming, says Jesus. Satan moves around. Philadelphia, right across the river from us. Again, we get back to the synagogue of Satan. Of Satan. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? These things saith he that is holy, he that is true. He that hath the key of David, he that openeth, no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door that no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. That's a promise of the rapture before the tribulation. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. You can lose rewards. You can't lose your salvation, but you can lose rewards. Jesus is the one who gives you your crowns. The victor's crowns. And someday you'll take those crowns, which he has earned, which he has given, and you realize I didn't really earn this in my own strength. It was Christ in me. And you'll take those crowns and you will cast them at his feet and say, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain and hath redeemed us unto God by his blood to receive honor and glory and power and riches and blessing. Worthy is the Lamb. Hold fast till I come, says Jesus. Don't give up your rewards. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. It was written to us. So where is Satan's seat today? Where is his throne today? Perhaps it's Washington. Perhaps it's Beijing. Perhaps it's somewhere in the Middle East where ISIS is beheading Christians. Perhaps it's Jerusalem. We know that it's going to be Jerusalem during the reign of the Antichrist. Because the Antichrist is going to sit there on a throne in the temple of God, showing that he himself is God. The false prophet is going to be doing miracles to deceive all them that dwell on the earth. I've preached on that this morning. It'll be Jerusalem, the city of the great king, where Satan finally sets up his throne. Where he has his one world government, which he's tried to do throughout all of history, as different nations have risen to power, he has moved the seat of his throne so they can control those who are in positions of authority, where the movers and shakers are located, where those who are pulling together other nations of the world to bring them into unity and into bonds with him are located. I suspect that today it's Washington, D.C. Can't prove that. We can't see the spiritual warfare that's going on around us, but we can see the effects of the spiritual warfare that's going on around us. And God has placed a small platoon of his soldiers in Collingswood. And we're not the ones that are to be embattled, where we circle the wagons while the enemy attacks. We are the church of Jesus Christ. And we are on the offensive. And the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power. You have called us to do spiritual warfare. Ephesians chapter 6, which we didn't have time to look at tonight, certainly tells us that you've given us all the necessary armor for our spiritual protection. You've given us the one sword which conquers the enemy, which is the sword of the Spirit, even the Word of God, our only offensive weapon in that entire list of armor. You've told us to pray always with all prayer and supplication in the power of your Holy Spirit. 
not only for one another, but Paul said pray for him too. And that goes for this preacher who needs your support through your people. And you have guaranteed that someday the victory belongs to Jesus. He crushed the head of the serpent at Calvary. And though the serpent is still writhing about and sticking his vicious fangs into many and infiltrating the churches, yet he is a defeated foe. It doesn't matter where his seat is, Jesus is the king. And here you had that group of believers waiting for Paul when he got to Tyre. Some unknown person, though known to you, during the persecution had shared Christ and in a city that had been the seat of Satan. Some came to faith. You stormed the gates of hell and they did not prevail against you. Cause each one of us to understand our responsibility in carrying the message forth and invading Satan's territory with the good news of Jesus Christ who died for our sins, who was buried, who rose again, who gives eternal life all of them who place their faith in him. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is number 540. Our hope is not in our